Romans 8, 26 through 39. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for these wonderful promises, for the privilege to um, be sought out by you, have the salvation uh, that the blood of Christ brings, the privilege of being able to be called your child, to belong to you, to be able to come to you on our own, to speak to you, to ask you uh, for things, for the storehouses of your grace to be open to us, if only we will ask. We thank you for the gift of the Spirit and the empowerment that we have in ministry. And we have all these things because of the shed blood of Christ on the cross as payment for our sin. God, this morning I pray that we would see the nature of our relationship with you, the gift of the Spirit, the promises you have made. God, teach us today uh, through Jeremy, through your word. Give us something that we can apply to our lives today in this next hour. We ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen, church family. It's great to worship with you this morning. If you would, go ahead and turn your Bibles to John chapter 16. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to John chapter 16. We're going to look at verse 16 here in a moment. There's a great truth that we need to hear this morning, and it's this. Remember that everything that matters for eternity has been settled in Christ. Let's say that again. Remember that everything that matters for eternity has been settled in Christ. Me being a pastor, I started pastoral ministry, full-time pastoral ministry, on February 1st of 2008. Um, and so this is 13 years for me, right? Yeah, 13 years for me that I've been doing full-time pastoral ministry. And uh, some of the, the job of just being a pastor is this, that I am there for many of your highs and many of your lows, right? I am there for your good times and your bad. But uh, the weddings are fun. Uh, the babies being born are fun. But in reality, most of my weeks is talking with you about the low times you're facing in this life. All right, most of the times that I spend with you through the weeks 
um, is times of trial and distress and tribulation for you. It's, uh, it's you dealing with mountains you don't feel like that you can climb. And uh, that's what we talk about. And that's what we pray through. We pray through hard times and prayer requests and, and trials and, and situations. And, and it's tough, right? It's tough on a lot of people. And the reality is this, not only just for believers, but for people who live in this world, this world is hard. It's hard. We face death. We face loss. We face trial. We, we, we face disease and sickness. And there, there's just so many things that, that become hard in this life. This past week, I had two of my kids had ear infections. One of them had strep throat. We were three for five. All right. Um, Deanna hadn't got much sleep. Uh, even this morning at 5 a.m., she was up trying to cool one of our kids down from having a fever. Um, they were in the bath at 5. And so I get it. Man, life is hard. And here's the truth that you need to hear. It's even harder for believers. Like some people think that when you become a believer, that, that life's become, supposed to become easier for you. And in reality, it becomes harder. And here's why. As believers, we're going to face the same thing that normal humans face, right, in this world, normal people face in this world. And then add on top of that, that this world is going to hate us because of Christ. It's going to persecute us because of Christ. We're going to have to deal with other people's sins and act graciously accordingly to those sins. And then we've got to deal with our own sin and seeking to kill our sin. We have to deny ourselves. And so this world is hard for everybody and especially hard for believers, that we deal with the sickness, we deal with everything, and then add on top of that persecution, sin, seeking to kill sin and forgive other people's sin. Is that an easy thing to do? Right? To kill sin in your life, to deny yourself, and then to forgive other people's sin? That's a hard thing to do. And so me as a pastor, I, I pray with people every week, every day, at night, in the morning, throughout the day, 10 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night. Two o'clock in the morning, like it, it's, it's all throughout the day dealing with talking to people who are struggling with sin, who are struggling with family issues, who are struggling with cancer, who are struggling with disease. Life's hard, church. Life's hard. But here's what you need to hear this morning and hear this with compassion. Jesus never said it'd be easy. I know there's false teachers out there that say that, but it's not true. Jesus never said that life would be easy. He actually said for believers the opposite. You say, where, Pastor? Well, let me read to you just a few verses. You don't need to, you can look them up if you want to, but just, just hear them, okay? I'm just going to read you a few. I'm not going to read you all of them because we have 20, 30 minutes, okay? But here's a few. Mark 13, 9. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my name's sake to bear witness before them. John 15, 18. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution and calamities for when i am weak then i am strong first peter 4 12 beloved do not be surprised at the fiery trials when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you don't be surprised that you're going to go through trials don't be surprised that you're going to go through insults and hardships and persecutions and calamities don't be surprised that the world hates you because it hates jesus don't be surprised that you're going to be persecuted. Don't be surprised that you're going to face disease. Don't be surprised that you're going to have hard times filled with anxiety and depression and bad news. Don't be surprised, church. Life is hard. You see, in reality, we want life to be easy because we know that one day it will be. One day life will be perfect. It'll be glorious. There'll be no more tears. No more hardships. No more disease. We will be completely redeemed and completely restored. And we long for that, don't we? That's called heaven. That's called heaven. 
It's not this world, nor this life. You see, in reality, this life is but a short mist that appears for a short time. This life is small and short, but eternity is long and great. And so we want our life to be great. And guess what? As believers, it will be in eternity. But not in a a fallen, depraved, sinful world. It will not be great. It will not be full of peace. There's a false belief out there that you can have positive thinking. If you have positive thinking and you speak your life to be great in this world, then it'll be great. People believe that, like Oprah. Okay? It won't be. Positive thinking, huh? Holding to positive thinking will not get you anything but positive thoughts. Okay? And I'm all for positive thoughts. Good for you. But we don't don't speak good things into our life. We pursue Christ. And in the hard times, we anchor ourselves to Him and we cling to Him. We cling to him. We hold fast to him, the one who gives us strength, the one who gives us joy, the one who gives us peace. We cling to him. So as believers, we're going to face hard times. Don't be surprised. Don't make the hard times easy. I can tell you as a pastor, I've walked through life with people for a long time. It's never easy. Never, it breaks me sometimes. It hurts me. There's times that I go, Pastor, I can't, I mean, I I go, God, I can't carry this burden. And it's when Jesus looks at me and said, I never asked you to. Right? As a pastor, sometimes I'm like, Jesus, I can't carry this burden for all these people. And Jesus said, I never asked you to. Because you can't. Only Jesus can only him and so this is where we find ourselves here in John 16 these disciples have left everything to follow Jesus they've left their professions all right they've left their family to follow Jesus and now here's what Jesus has told them I'm about to leave and where I go you can't go Okay. By the way, the world hates me, so the world's going to hate you, and the world's going to persecute you, disciples. But don't worry. Take heart. I have overcome the world. Well, that sounds awesome, Jesus, right? Take heart. Jesus has overcome the world. The disciples are like, I'm left here. If we could forward, they don't know this, but they're about to be imprisoned. They're about to be um, persecuted. Some of them are about to be crucified. Right? Like, top three deaths you don't ever want to have. Crucifixion is top three. Okay? It's top three. So some of them are about to face crucifixions. They're about to be imprisoned. They're about to be hungry. Okay? And Jesus is like, and I'm going to leave you. But take heart. Be courageous. You can do it. Well, the disciples are pretty sorrowful about this, right? Like, the God who's done all these miracles, the Savior, who called me to be his disciple, is leaving me. And so I want you to understand the context of these verses because the disciples are sorrowful. They are down and out. They are staring at a mountain that they don't feel like they can climb. They don't feel like they can do it. They are sorrowful. They are, they're in a hard time. They're in a hard place. And Jesus is leaving them. You ever been there? You're in a hard place and you don't know that you can do it. It's where they feel that. They're at. And so here we are in, in John 16, 16. Jesus says to the disciples this, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And Jesus is talking about, he's about to die. He's about to be buried, and on third day, he's going to raise from the tomb, and he's going to be 
alive again. They're going to see him again. Okay? Then Jesus is going to leave them, and one day they'll see him in paradise, right? Same as us. He's, he's left, and right, he, one day he'll come back and get us, or we'll die, and he will take us home. And so here we are, verse 17. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he, has said to, that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? Yeah, right, right. Like, where are you at? What do you mean a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. And so he said to them, is this what you are asking yourself? What I meant by saying a little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Verse 20, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament. You will weep and lament. This is what Jesus tells them. But the world will rejoice. When Jesus dies, they're going to be sorrowful. And they're going to be sad. And they're going to scatter. And the world is going to rejoice. They're going to rejoice. You will be sorrowful, in the verse 20, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Why will their sorrow turn to joy? Because Jesus wins. Because Jesus is the victor. And because Jesus is the victor, we as his followers are victorious forever. Forever. And nothing can separate us from that victory. That's why we read Romans. Why had Pastor Keith read that? Nothing can separate us. Nothing. Not death, not tribulation, not angel, not any power. Not anything can separate us from the victory we have in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us from this joy, this, this delight, this everlasting joy. And then he, he tells them, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that the human being has, was born into the world. Now, if you've never been through this, you don't understand what this verse is actually saying. But let me tell you. Okay? Lydia, first child, Deanna said, I'm having it natural. We have no idea. We're so naive. We don't even take a class for that. Okay? Mistake. Okay? 17 hours in, I look at Deanna, and I'm like, I'll never bring this up again because you told me not to, and I'm trying to be strong for you. But do you want to get an epidural? And she was like, don't bring it up again. Yes, ma'am. Four hours, three, four hours later, she was like, go get that epidural. All right? After 20 hours of trying to have a baby, it was... It was a little tough. Okay? Hannah, our second born, she's coming. As soon as we get to the doctor, epidural. And I was like, high five. <laughs> the third one comes, Elijah. Uh, Lydia came at 38 weeks. Hannah at 37. Elijah at 36. So it was like, uh-oh, water just broke. 36 weeks. Throw stuff in the car. Right? So we do. We get there. Water breaks. We get there. Um, she's dilated. It's happening. Doctor doesn't even get there in time. Carly, our secretary now, uh, office managers, she delivers. Elijah. All natural. Worst thing I've ever been through in my life. <laughs> you can say the worst thing Deanna's ever been through? Absolutely. Okay? For sure. But me there, listening to her scream like that, like going, hey, 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 baby, what do you want me to do, baby? <laughs> Awful. I am Team Epidural. I'd love to talk to you more about that if you have any more questions, but please let me know. I'll really want <laughs> Team Epidural, okay? So after that, we, we have Micah, and she's like, I'm thinking about doing it natural again. I was like, why? Why would you do that? No one wants to do that again. And she was like, really? I didn't think it was that bad. You don't think it's that bad because it was quick? And then you held your baby. And I'm like, this verse spoke. When she said that, I'm like, are you serious? It is exactly what this verse says. When the hour has come, it says this. I mean, when a woman gives birth, she has sorrow because the hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish. And I'm like, girl, you don't remember. You do not remember. I remember. And it's true. It's true. When we get to eternity, 
It'll be so great. The joy that we have in Christ is so great. It's hard to even remember the sorrow and the anguish. Through Jesus, we have this eternal, incredible joy that can never be taken from us. No hardship, no anguish can ever take this joy that we have, this delight that we have in Jesus. It's called the, the great reversal. People who are lost in this world, facing these hardships with no one to turn to, I and mean, that, that saddens me. But for us as believers who are going to face hardships knowing that we have a trump card called Jesus that overshadows all the joy. I mean, overshadows all the persecution and gives us joy and delight. It's incredible. It's incredible. And so through Jesus, the first point I want you to get is that through Jesus, sorrow is turned into joy. The deepest sorrow you could ever imagine is turned into joy. So often when we face this sorrow in life, we become very nearsighted, don't we? We focus on just what the problem is. And what I want to do this morning is remind you that there is a far bigger picture out there. His name's Jesus and he's working out everything for your good and his glory. So cling to him. Cling to his joy. Hold fast to him. Delight in him. Everything that matters, he's already worked out. He's already won. So cling to him. I know this all too well. Certain times I've prayed over stillborns. Prayed over people at their darkest, hardest moment. And I don't have any answers for them. The only answer that I have is Jesus. And the reality is that's the only one that can help them in the darkest of days. Because it's sure not me. It's Jesus. It's his joy. It's his peace. Him. So Jesus is telling his disciples, you're going to be hated. You're going to be persecuted. But take heart. Cling to Jesus. Hold fast to Jesus. I don't know what's going on in your life right now. I don't know if you feel like there's a mountain that you can't climb, but you can through the help of one. His name is Jesus. He's the only one. He's the only one that's good. He's the only one that's faithful. He's the only one that's sovereign. He's the only one that can carry you. He's the only arms that can wrap around you and give you a peace that you can barely even comprehend. It's Jesus. Continue on. Verse 25. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I have came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and I am going to the Father. So he tells them plainly. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. Listen to verse 33. I have said these things to you that in me... In who? That in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation. 
but take heart. I have overcome the world. That word overcome is victorious. That word take heart means be confident. Be confident. Be courageous. Why? Because Jesus is victorious. You're going to face things in this life. But take heart. Be confident. The victor is on his throne. And he calls you son. And he calls you daughter. Second point I want you to get is worldly tribulation through Jesus is overshadowed by eternal peace. Worldly tribulation through Jesus is overshadowed by eternal peace. This peace is not worldly happiness. It is security. I told you this before. It is the Hebrew word for shalom. It means perfect relationship, harmony between God and His children. Between the Father and His Children, take heart. You have security. You have peace. You are in relationship with God for eternity. No matter what this world throws at you, it cannot strip this peace, this security from you. It cannot strip this joy from you because it's from the Father through the Son. And He is victorious. So take heart. Be confident. Be courageous. The truth is this. Followers of Jesus have eternal joy and eternal peace through Jesus. And nothing can take this from them. And so I say again, remember that everything that matters for eternity has been settled in Christ. In Him. So what do we need to do as believers? Number one, be confident in who Christ is. Be confident in Him. Number two, hold tightly to His faithfulness, His love, and His strength. So be confident in Christ. Number two, hold tightly or hold fastly to His faithfulness, His love, and His strength. Number three, rest in His truth. When life feels like it is, it's crushing you or when you feel like you are drowning, you know what you do? You rest in His truth. You rest in His Word. You rest at His feet. That's what you do. You're confident in Him. You hold tightly to who He is and you rest in His loving truth and His loving arms. So I know you're thinking, well, Pastor... That sounds easier said than done. That sounds easier said than done. That may be true. I never said it was easy. I want you to see this picture. I'll put this picture up here. Many of you follow Mel Ruling on Facebook. I asked for her permission to share this. Don't worry. Uh, this is a picture of Mel. Many of you may have read this, but uh, in, in the rulings uh, life right now, they have a lot going on, just like in some of you. I've prayed with many of you. Um, they're dealing with a lot of things. Uh, Frank, we know, um, has cancer. Um, Martha Ruling, um, you, you know that um, she's going through some things. Brother Danny is serving her. Mel has MS. And a little over a year ago, she had a double mastectomy. Because she had breast cancer. A lot of things is going on in the life. And I use them as an example, and that's true of a lot of you. And I'm not going to share everything that's going on in life with the people here. But I asked for Mel's permission to share this because she's going through a lot. And so this right here is a picture of her getting ready to walk in to have a double mastectomy by herself because of COVID. By herself. And this is what she said. And she, she quotes this. Says this, when the earth is cracking behind your feet, you go forward. One, front, one foot in front of the other. One foot in front of the other. She goes on to say this, one year ago today, I walked into the hospital by myself, COVID policy, for a double mastectomy. I didn't know until today 
that Carson snapped this pic of me. And when he showed me, the emotions of that moment came flooding back. Leaving our family prayer circle and walking alone through those doors was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. But I moved forward. But I moved forward. One foot in front of the other. I know some of you have suffered great loss or harder struggles than I have this year, is what she said. But let me encourage you to cling to God. It is only through Him, not our own strength, that we can put one foot in front of the other and find peace in moving forward. Amen, sister. I don't just preach this saying, hey, guys, cling to Jesus. I'm telling you, he's the only one to cling to. I'm telling you that he is the only one that will help us. He's the only one who will give us peace. He's the only one who will give us joy. He's the only one that will carry us through hard times. It's him. It's him. And so I read again, verse 33. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. The one who overcame the world and overcomes the world, his name is Jesus. And he allows you to hold fast to him. He allows you to cling to him. He gives you eternal joy and he gives you eternal peace. If you would just lay it at his feet. Lay it at his feet. This world's hard. You can't beat it. But Jesus has. You become victorious through holding tightly to him. You can't just speak positive thoughts and make life better. You cling to Jesus. You cling to his word. You rest in his truth. You're confident in who he is. He told these disciples that they're going to struggle and I am telling you that life is going to be hard. It's hard for everyone. And there are seasons of life that's harder for some. And in those seasons, I'm telling you, the only one that really gives joy and peace, the only one that will carry you through it, is Jesus. So I don't know what's going on in your life right now. I have no idea. Some of you I do. But I don't know with all of you. I only know what some of you have shared with me. And I know that times are tough. Here's my advice. This morning, this altar is open. How about you just cast it at his feet? Let Jesus' loving arms stretch around you. Let him give you joy and peace. So, Pastor, how do I do it? Well, just like Mel said, one foot in front of the other. You keep walking toward him. You keep clinging to him and his word. So this morning, this altar is open. Come cast your cares to him. He's a loving God. If you're here this morning and you're lost, you say, well, Pastor, I, I'm lost. And man, I would love to have Jesus to anchor to. I would love to have this joy and this peace you're talking about, this security, this delight. Then come and talk to me. I would love to tell you about how you can follow Jesus this morning. However God is moving in your life or the Holy Spirit is working in your life, just be obedient. Be faithful. Rest in his loving arms. Hold fast to who he is and what he's done for you. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are such a good God. I know that this world is hard. But you're here with us to help us, to carry us. And so God, I pray that's what we do, that we cling to you this morning and let you help us. And that we rest in you. That we spend time anchoring and clinging to you. So Father, I pray that this morning that my faith family will look to you and rest in your loving arms. I pray that any lost this morning will come to know you, to know that, Jesus, you died for them, 
that you rose from the grave, that you are seated at the right hand of the throne of God, and they, all they need to do is repent and believe and anchor themselves to you, to love you. And they too will one day have eternal life with you. To God, however the Holy Spirit is working, I pray the Holy Spirit will move in the life of these people here. And they'll leave here today saved or, or resting in your loving arms and casting all of their cares to you and all of their burdens at your feet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.